Very busy, busy I'm alive. I'm using highlighters and colored markers. Yeah. It's okay. Use a spectrum. Yeah. Uh, well, my wife has put my calendar back. Um, and you know how to get it. Uh, no. Good oh, evening. Okay. Welcome to the Monomoy Regional School Committee's public hearing for the district's fiscal year 2019 budget. And call that public hearing to order at 611. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Carpenter. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Tag. So this uh, budget presentation is uh, much the uh, same presentation that we have uh, discussed uh, at the school committee for our last several meetings just updated with the most recent numbers so there are some uh, some uh, reductions that we've made to this budget that I'll get into since the last time that we've met to try to fall within the fiscal wherewithal of our two towns um, I'll be going through these these slides very quickly um, but uh, but this whole packet of information will also be uh, put on the district's website immediately after the presentation so that uh, people can go through these slides at a slower pace and uh, um, you know, dig into the numbers if they want. So we just want to start by saying that uh, an investment in the schools is a good investment in our towns and uh, supports our children in the future. Um, one of the things that uh, we have been focused on in the district is growth, uh, just making sure that our children are seeing, uh, seeing strong academic growth. And I have shared this uh, when we were at the Harwich Selectman's meeting. Uh, we, uh, if we look at uh, spring 2011, before Monomoy came together uh, as, as a fully regionalized district, um, the uh, areas up in red are uh, spring 2011 MCAS growth scores for Harwich and Chatham. Those that are in red are growth scores that are essentially growing less than the state average. You need to be growing at 50 or higher to be above the state average. And I think the, the punchline here is that, you know, that at the time, uh, across the grade levels from grade four to grade 10, Harwich was growing just beneath the state average and Chatham was growing just above the state average and we have been trying to push these scores and get them out of the red zone and hopefully see them getting into the high 50s and, and beyond. So if we look at, again on the left is uh, spring 2011 where, where we were to the spring 2017 where we currently are, uh, we've seen that we're out of that red zone uh, in all grade levels and subject areas except for at the moment uh, uh, eighth grade math which we hope uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the uh, students that were in eighth grade math last year were, were students that have, hadn't actually had exposure to the math and focus curriculum. So we're hoping that we'll see as, as more and more students have that math and focus background and start coming up to the high school in grade eight that we're gonna see those numbers change and ideally, by seeing our students growing above that state average, starting from the youngest grades all the way up, that we'll hopefully see our achievement scores across uh, these subject areas also increase over time. Uh, there was stuff in the newspaper about you know, low graduation rates. We've seen the graduation rates at the high school climb continuously over the last three years. Uh, if we look at the high school MCAS, uh, growth scores. You know, we've seen the growth percentiles uh, grow in the last over the last three years in English and you know, and in math. So we're you know so we're seeing that high growth, um, and uh, you know and that if we continue to see that high growth uh, across grade levels, we're going to see the achievement scores that we you know we ultimately realize at uh, at tenth grade also skyrocket. In terms of enrollment, uh, and uh, our schools, uh, I want to differentiate between enrollment, which are kids in the seats, versus foundation enrollment when we get into it here in a couple more slides. But, but we see our district has 64% of the students attending Monomoy schools are from Harwich, 23 are from Chatham, and 13% of the students uh, reside in communities outside of Harwich or Chatham. Those are our school choice students. And our enrollment is hanging fairly, you know, fairly steady over the, over the last over the last three years, as is the proportion of uh, of Harwich, Chatham, and uh, Choice students. 
one of the things that we, you know, we had talked about uh, as we were starting to form as a district is needing to be uh, thoughtful about how many choice students come into the district to make sure that, that we built, you know, this high school was really built to sustain what's called the foundation enrollment worth of students, which is you know, the students in, in Harwich and Chatham that attend public schools. And at the time we were, our, our, our towns had been taking in more students through choice than, um, than potentially this building was built for a, a, an enrollment of 700. And we've been trying to make sure that we have the enrollment of the district uh, overlapped with uh, actual enrollment, overlapped with foundation enrollment, so that ideally as we move forward here in the next couple of years, when the fifth grade, current fifth grade cohort comes up to the high school, we're going to see this building really at its maximum capacity. And we should be hovering right at about 700. We tried to thoughtfully manage choice to make sure that we're not going back to our town saying, oh, we did such a great job bringing choice kids in that we don't have room at the end. You know, so we're just trying to make sure that we have that our, our choice student population managed to make sure that we have this that, you know, this high school not over uh, that capacity. But we do anticipate that uh, in just a few years from now that we're going to see this building creep up from the mid sixes to uh, just about 700, if not just a hair over. Foundation enrollment is what our assessment is based on, and this has uh, you know, just foundation enrollment for the for the towns, uh, and then foundation enrollment for the district. <coughs> Again, there's a uh, a slight uh, decrease in that foundation enrollment for Chatham, and we'll talk about that and how it impacts the budget and the assess or how it impacts the assessment uh, towards the end of this pre presentation, and as Chatham starts to have a foundation enrollment that goes down a little hard, which is going uh, is going up just uh, just a hair. Uh, the uh, budget, one of the factors that uh, impacts our budget is uh, state aid. Uh, state aid's the chapter 70 state aid. Um, state aid is based on the enrollment of students that live in Chatham or the enrollment of students that uh, uh, that uh, that live in Harwich. Uh, there's a calculation in the state aid that deals with the minimum required contribution. So how much are the two towns supposed to be funding education at a minimum? That minimum required contribution is related to wealth factors within the town, uh, not just property wealth, but the wealth of uh, the incomes that, uh, that the residents have in, in our communities are, are communities that, that have, uh, have uh, we could say, some great uh, real estate, land wealth, um, but, uh, but the incomes of many of our families and our communities um, don't reflect some of, the, uh, you know, some of the properties, particularly those properties uh, along the water. Um, so those factors, those factors combine together to, um, to uh, come up with a state aid calculation of this Chapter 70 funding. So the Chapter 70 funding over uh, you know, over the last several years, has been has been going up at a fairly a fairly level rate. Um, we uh, you know we have put into this budget uh, the what's called the governor's numbers are, uh, are put into are put into this budget based on the uh, chapter 78 that the governor uh, came out with uh, last month, and uh, and also when those numbers were released. They released what the minimum required contributions would be for Harwich and Chatham. Again, we get into that towards the end of the presentation when it comes to assessments. The budget was developed, uh, keeping in mind the strategic plan that the district has, uh, wanting to move forward those strategic initiatives. Uh, ever since I've come here to Monomoy, we have also been uh, very thoughtfully thinking about class size, trying to make sure that we have a support of class sizes in the district. So this budget is based on having average class sizes at our elementary schools of 18 students plus or minus one in the classroom, and at our middle and high school to have 19 students plus or minus two in those classrooms. And I want to emphasize the, these are averages. There will be occasional classes that are going to have a little bit more than that, and they're offset by classes somewhere else uh, within the school that have a, that have a little bit less. 
And a really important factor for me is, you know, we, uh, Katie, our business manager, and I work, uh, you know, work in tandem with our town managers and our finance directors to try to make sure that the budgets that we're presenting here to the school committee and our community are ones that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, fit the fiscal circumstances that our towns have. So we want to make sure that we're good partners in this. That this is a, it's a three-way dance between our school district and our two towns. In terms of budget assumptions, the, the assumption here is that that enrollment trend is going to continue, that we'll have level, uh, level enrollment. This is a level staffed budget uh, that, that has the contractually ob obligated steps and lanes. Uh, we have the governor's state aid numbers in here, the minimum required contributions that were, that were released at that same time. Uh, health insurance, uh, we had talked in earlier budget er iterations that we were concerned that health insurance might come in as high as 15%. Uh, health insurance, thankfully, came in at 6%, which has allowed us to kind of adjust other areas within the budget. Uh, the, uh, the way the assessment gets, uh, gets uh, apportioned to the two towns is based on a three-year rolling average of enrollment. Um, so the, uh, that three-year rolling average is put into this. There's a $100,000 a commitment in this budget to fund OPEB, which stands for the Outstanding Post-Employment Benefits. So this is aimed at helping the district off into the future with those, <coughs> with those uh, uh, benefits for retirees. Um, and then there is also a $50,000 uh, formation of a stabilization account that is in this budget. And I'll speak uh, later in this presentation about what is a stabilization account and why, you know, why one has it and the steps to go about forming it. Uh, as I said, uh, the average class sizes are uh, within those guidelines. We have just a slide here of what we anticipate if we roll the enrollments that we currently have or are projecting up, uh, what those class sizes would look like at the different grade levels. Uh, as I said, this is a, this is a level staff budget. Uh, the district has, since, uh, since FY16, uh, you know, had really only one FTE addition over the last, over the last four years, but this is level uh, for the last year. One of the factors that, uh, that's important to note uh, just in terms of reporting out to our communities is uh, excess and deficiency. Excess and deficiency, I, I would say, if we're thinking of it as the, on the town side, it may be free cash would be the equivalent of what an excess and deficiency account is for a school district. So these are funds that at the end of a fiscal year uh, are, uh, that are unexpended roll into an account that's called an excess and deficiency account. That account, uh, can grow over time, and uh, and if it grows up to five percent of your district's budget, the amount of funds beyond five percent need to be returned to, in this case, uh, the uh, you know, Harwich Harwich and Chatham. We had set out uh, as we formed this district with an excess and deficiency account, our reserve account of zero. I mean, it's a brand new school district, so we had uh, excess and deficiency of zero. Uh, we had talked at the time, and uh, you know, through some of the sage guidance on the on the school committee, of building that reserve, you know, to help buffer the school district and help buffer our towns through some some challenging fiscal times. We had we had talked about growing that to four percent of our budget over the first seven years of the district. Uh, we were lucky for you know through a couple uh, factors uh, to see us grow that reserve up to 5% of the budget within the first five years. Um, so currently we have uh, the FY17 certified excess and deficiency accounts is $1.8 million. Um, we do in, uh, in the formation of this budget use an appreciable amount of excess and deficiency. We'll use $705,000 of excess and deficiency to help reduce the assessment to help reduce the bill that the two towns will get, and I'll get into that uh, a little bit later on. So every year, you know, so at the end of this fiscal year, there will be some unexpended funds in the budget. Those will roll into the excess and deficiency account, so, so it will grow, but we also each year 
you know, each year use some of that account to help uh, help defray the costs of the of the school district on the two towns. We also have a couple other uh, accounts that are used to help defray a budget. You know, one of them being school choice. And what we have on this slide is just sort of an acknowledgement of we have students who choice into this district. That's that 13% of our enrollment uh, choices in from other towns. There are tuition dollars that come in with those children. But we, as we know, have students that choice out of our district, and uh, you know, so we, you know, so we're seeing a uh, a school choice revenue of roughly 1.3 million dollars, and a school choice expenditure behind this budget of roughly 1.2 million dollars, and there's still a balance of about 300 thousand dollars in that account. Uh, the school choice funds are largely used to offset some of the. Uh, some of the salaries that we have within the district. Another account that, uh, uh, that the district has for, for its reserves is called Circuit Breaker. This comes from expensive uh, out of district placements. These are expensive special education placements um, that the district is reimbursed a portion of by the state. Um, so you're able to go and take those and, uh, and, and uh, help offset your special education costs in future fiscal years. In this budget, we're using $191,000 of circuit breaker to offset this budget, and we're anticipating seeing $191,000 of circuit breaker come in. Uh, then we have uh, tuitions out uh, to, uh, to uh, charter school and to, uh, to inner district school choice. Uh, we had already mentioned the the inter-district school choice tuitions, uh, but there's also a projected one, uh, $1.2 million in uh, charter school tuitions that go out. Just to quickly differentiate between those two lines, uh, when a child choices out through inter-district school choice, which is the first line going across, uh, those children cost the school district roughly $5,000 a piece. It's, it was set by the state back in the early 90s. Um, and, and if that child has some special education needs, there's a small uh, uh, additor to, to that $5,000 to account for uh, the additional services the child needs. When a student leaves for a charter school, it's a bigger blow to a school district financially. So the per pupil expenditure uh, for that child exits. So, you know, so we'll actually talk about what the per pupil expenditures look like here at Monway Regional versus, versus other districts. but. Yeah, but we're seeing about $15,000 leaves the district uh, if a student were to choice out to a charter school. And, and again, you know, when, we, you know, when we talk about the importance of supporting a budget, and supporting the schools, and making sure we have, strong, have a strong educational program, the, you know, the stronger the program we have here, the more opportunities for kids, the less students that we should see choicing out. Okay, in terms of budget drivers for, uh, behind this, um, as I mentioned, we have, we have some things that we have done um, within this budget to try to, to, try to uh, have it fit closer within the fiscal wherewithal, particularly of Harwich. So, um, so we, you know, we tweaked um, some, of the, you know, some of the areas in, uh, in uh, different, uh, different budget lines um, uh, you know, from one end of the budget to the other. Um, at uh, the Harwich Selectmen's meeting this past week, uh, Katie and I were specifically told, I think, multiple times to sharpen our pencil. Uh, so this is you know, this is essentially two hundred thousand dollars of pencil sharpening uh, that's uh, that's behind the budget. Um, it, it's still after that. It's it's still a level service budget, um, but uh, uh, Katie and I have uh, have already started the mantra with the administrative team. You know that there's you know. You know, there's there's not a lot. Uh, you know, there's there's not wiggle room in this. You know, so uh, if, you know, I think we have to. You know, the, the whole line to the principals: if if it's not in the budget, you know, the answer is no, and uh, um, not well. Yeah, you know, I I think I can find that, or let's you know, let's see if we can find that. This, this is a this is a tight budget this uh, this year, but we're able to maintain staffing and programs, which is good for our kids and our families. We also have uh, have things that uh, that are budget drivers. Uh, you know, one of the big things is is just our, our staff. Uh, you know, we have 
Um, you know, we have steps and lanes and, and a teacher's contract and you know, contract with our, our clerical staff and our custodians. That's all built in this. The health insurance is a huge driver uh, here. There's other insurances that are going up. Uh, and then we have uh, some of those uh, tuitions uh, for, uh, for out of district are heading up as well. And so there's, you know, uh, of these contractually obligated drivers, this is 87% you know, of the increase in this budget, you know, we really don't have a choice about. It's, you know, these are things that are just set in stone in contract. And then there are things that, you know, that we have some choice with, and this is, you know, these are things uh, that, you know, strategic initiatives that we're trying to move forward, um, you know, part of that strategic plan. So, you know, we, you know, we have talked about uh, bringing more of a robotics focus to technology education at the high school and uh, have uh, teachers Larry Souza and Rich Oldak go and, uh, and take us forward, uh, in a sort of shifting from a uh, more traditional wood shop approach to tech education to, uh, you know, to high tech robotics. Uh, and a lot of the presentations we've had on curriculum and the, uh, the strategic plan looking at the elementary ELA curriculum and, uh, and having a, the beginning of a three year investment in a program called Words Their Way. Uh, uh, I know uh, Melissa has uh, given presentations to the school committee on different uh, social emotional learning uh, initiatives that are underway, so to make sure that we're funding those social emotional learning um, uh, initiatives here. Uh, we also have some needs, particularly at the middle school, uh, for some STEM equipment, and we, we'd like to see at the middle school some of this sort of high-tech television video stuff that has been happening at the high school, uh, embed that earlier on at the middle school, so, you know, so there's some cost behind that. Uh, we also have some other uh, strategic uh, improvements that are behind this budget, you know, that include, include uh, consultants for the strategic plan, uh, focus on some community engagement, uh, an athletic director who stretched thin between the high school and middle school to get her some part-time clerical support um, to, uh, at, the, at the middle school there has been a uh, uh, a need for some additional clinical support. We only have, uh, have one guidance counselor at the middle school to make sure that we have the clinical support available at the middle school, so that's behind here. And then uh, starting that stabilization account that I mentioned that we'll talk about later on. So at the end of the day, you know, this is when the school committee will vote this budget, uh, this slide um, lists you know, what that budget looks like by line. The school committee votes it by line. Uh, ultimately, this is a $39 million, $708,354 budget. Um, it is a total budget increase over the prior fiscal year of 4.18%. And you know this this slide just uh, just looks at the uh, you know, the the major lines within the budget and how those lines have tracked have tracked over time. You know clearly if you look at this, uh, our budgets our budgets are largely um, uh, paying for teachers and and uh, and employee benefits. So if you look if you look at just you know, what's, you know, what's behind the budget? You know, 46% of the budget are instructional salaries. Uh, you have your custodians, your administrative salaries. You know, so, you know, so you look at that, you know, 70% of this school district's budget are personnel costs. You know, that's, you know, that's a, huge, you know, a huge piece. The other big piece is there's that orange piece of the pie up there. That's 6% uh, of our budget are for those tuitions that are for students that are attending charter schools and school choice. Uh, you know, the, uh, the big trivia question uh, that uh, I'm sure they'll have at the Squire at their next trivia night is, uh, you know, you know the, uh, how much does it cost per day to educate a student at Monomoy? $114.99. Um, of those, uh, those $81.22 are the personnel costs. Um, and if you, you know, if you think about uh, sending your child to uh, you know, to summer camp um, and how much you're paying you know, a day for summer camp. It's you know this is a pretty good value. 
within this budget uh, is a, uh, a comprehensive uh, capital plan. You know, one of the things that we are very proud of is I believe that our schools are actually in better shape today than when we inherited them for the school district, and we've done a great job of keeping Chatham Elementary School, Harwich <laughs> Elementary School, the middle school, and this high school building looking as good as they can and uh, to maintain the taxpayers' investment in those buildings. So there is maintenance that happens in this budget to keep Chatham Elementary School uh, as a great place to, uh, you know, to teach and learn. There's uh, Harwich Elementary School in this, both, uh, you know, both the physical facility but also on the technology side. Both of those elementary schools have some pretty significant um, enhancements that are going to be happening on the technology side uh, where we'll be seeing the wireless infrastructure updated. Um, these days, uh, you know, you know, we, you know, Wi-Fi uh, is sort of everywhere and our need to use it's everywhere. You might be thinking, okay, well, what elementary school kid is going to be bringing in a cell phone and you know, needing to connect with the Wi-Fi? Well, these days, state testing is shifting towards um, you know, towards uh, computers. So, you know, so all of these MCAS exams are going to need to be done on computers. So we have fleets of Chromebooks that do connect to the Wi-Fi, uh, and we have those Chromebooks now embedded in how the children are learning in a lot of different subject areas at all the different grade levels so that, so that they have familiarity and comfort with the technology before they have to sit down with it to take the uh, state assessments. At the, at the middle school and high school, uh, again, we have uh, technology that we'll be uh, putting in, uh, refreshing some of the Chromebooks at the high school and at the middle school, again, to, uh, you know, to, ins you know, to make sure that we have additional Chromebooks for, uh, for them. Perhaps the biggest ticket item when it comes to the capital plan are the restroom facilities at the stadium field. Uh, so there is a concession stand bathroom facility that is at the stadium field. And so far that building has largely been funded by, uh, uh, by community members and, uh, and it's been completely erected by community members. Uh, but we've had conversations amongst the Boosters Club uh, that, and uh, Simon Evans will be here later uh, tonight uh, as part of the school committee uh, to do a little booster club presentation and to talk to the school committee and uh, but uh, but the conversation was if we if if we waited to um, to raise the funds through boosters and other organizations it's going to take a while to raise the funds for that bathroom facility and uh, to actually do the plumbing that's that's required for a multi-stall bathroom set is not it's it's not really in the wheelhouse of of those of the of the folks, nor uh, it gets into permitting um, as well. So we you know, we felt that it would be better if we very transparently put it within uh, you know within our budget. Um, I, my understanding is before uh, you know, before I came here and before uh, this building was built that there were conversations uh, that uh, you know, that the uh, the building project would not carry uh, the uh, you know, a sort of bathroom facility at the stadium field, so we feel that it's um, it, it's best not to have it be part of the uh, since promises were made that not have it be part of the building project, but to have it actually you know, be embedded in one of our budgets and have have it be talked about that way. So, uh, as I said, uh, this is a thirty-nine million seven hundred thousand dollar budget. That doesn't mean that's how much it's going to cost for the towns to run the school district. There are factors that that fit into this. Uh, part of it's state aid, uh, and then we have uh, excess and efficiency. How much of excess and efficiency are we going to use? Uh, we have the minimum required contribution impacts uh, the the assessment. Um, so we'll you know we'll kind of get into how that. Uh, yeah, how that works, but if you look at what's behind our budget, our budget is primarily funded by assessments. So 64% of our budget is funded by the assessment to Harwich. 23% of our budget is funded by the assessment to Harwich. 
The next biggest slice up there is what comes in, and the blue slice is what comes in from state aid, and the other significant piece up there is 3% of our budget comes in as these inter-district school choice uh, tuitions. I had mentioned uh, the importance of minimum required contribution, and this, uh, this was, uh, this was a, uh, we'll call it a budget challenge over the last couple months. Um, we, uh, we were waiting for the insurance number to come in, and we had talked in earlier conversations at the school committee level that, uh, that we had uh, been anticipating a 15% increase in insurance, and then we were able to breathe a sigh of relief for about a day because insurance came in at 6%, but then when the governor's numbers came out, uh, there was a $459,000 swing in minimum required contribution towards Harwich, which you know, took any sort of potential uh, breathing space that we had in the budget and suddenly, you know, suddenly, so we were able to kind of decrease the costs of, uh, of, our, of our school's budget on the town of Harwich with the health insurance savings and suddenly uh, minimum required contributions start shifting over. And that's, that's largely driven that there's a slight decline that we're seeing in the number of children from Chatham in the district in this upcoming fiscal year relative to Harwich. And that's, that's probably what's driving much of this, but there's a slight increase for uh, Chatham, uh, a, a much larger increase for Harwich, and that tended to be a, make a little bit of a shift uh, between uh, which, one, which one of the communities was going to have the, see the largest percent increase. So you'll see, you'll see as we get into the assessment, the two towns have a slightly different percent increase in their budget. <coughs> And that's largely attributable to this minimum required contribution shift. Um, so the minimum required contribution trends over time. Uh, Chatham has been relatively steady, uh, and we see that in this one fiscal year, uh, Harwich has had an uptick, and that you know that was one of the budget driver challenges that we had. Uh, Three-year rolling, an average. This is this is partly behind. That, um, but we're you know we're seeing you know, that the three-year rolling average is smooth, and I want to kind of emphasize that that three-year rolling average <coughs> deals with how yeah how we apportion the the budget between Harwich and Chatham, but that minimum required contribution, the state doesn't do a three-year rolling average on enrollment. Uh, it's it's sort of an instantaneous you know how many students from Harwich, how many students from Chatham, and that's. That's, I think, partly why you'll, you, you can see in any one fiscal year a slight or a, you know, a, a swing in minimum required contribution um, because it, it doesn't have that, that three-year buffering that, that the regional agreement uh, provides to help smooth out year-to-year uh, -year trends. So our assessment uh, at the top in, uh, in sort of peach up there is the uh, 39 uh, uh, 0.7 million dollar budget line, and uh, from that we have uh, you back off the state aid, the amount of excess and deficiency that's being used in this. We're using 705 thousand dollars to offset the uh, cost of this budget. Uh, you have charter school aid that comes in from the state, uh, doesn't pay for nearly all. It pays for a very small fraction of of your charter school expenses, Medicaid, interest, miscellaneous revenue. So, so you, back this, you back this down, you come up with an operating assessment. Uh, the, you have the minimum required contribution that the two towns uh, need to provide. That gets deducted, and then you break, you, you break the uh, budget out based on the, uh, the way uh, that three-year rolling average plays out between the two towns. So, you know, so we see that uh, that operating assessment, it's 73.25% of its assessed towards Harwich and Chatham 26.75%. We'll just kind of jump to the proverbial punchline here. Um, so the draft assessment for the, for the two towns combined, it's a $34 million, uh, $820,076 uh, draft assessment for the two towns. Uh, and it will ultimately make uh, Harwich's 
uh, increase over the prior fiscal year, a 3.43% increase in the assessment. Uh, Chatham is a 3.01% increase in the assessment or an overall 3.32% increase in the assessment. And that the difference between, again, Harwich and Chatham is that minimum co required contribution is providing the biggest difference why the two towns aren't the same percentage. And, you know, I, I, I know uh, Chatham, when, uh, when Chatham presents, uh, the town manager presents and talks about you know, uh, police, fire, DPW, the health insurance is included in it, but one of the things we, we sometimes get, have sort of apples and oranges comparison is, uh, is when in Harwich they present you know, sort of the increase for DPW or police or fire, uh, health insurance is carried over on the side in the, in the town budgets there. You know, so if we were to look at what, our, what this increase looks like if we were not talking health insurance, if we were a town department where health insurance was carried separately, uh, our budget's a 2.76% increase in Harwich, a 2.07% increase when it comes to Chatham if you exclude health insurance from this. And health insurance is a, even, I mean, 6% is a, it's a big budget item and that 6% makes a big difference. So just to compare uh, education spending on Cape Cod, and this was a conversation I was having with the uh, school committee's finance subcommittee, and uh, Terry, you know, Terry uh, asked a, a good question, just you know, how do we stack up, or actually I think it started with Steve and there was some conversation at the table. If we look at what our per pupil expenditures are at here at Monomoy relative to Cape Cod, uh, uh, we have a per pupil expenditure of 16000 $803, and, and when I mentioned the charter school tuitions, you know, this is, this is what that, you know, that charter school tuition is based on. Um, if you look at where Monomoy is relative to, you know, to other, you know, other areas of the town, you know, we're pretty similar to Mashpee, you know, slightly, slightly more than Mashpee, slightly less than Dennis Yarmouth. And, you know, one of the things I, you know, I wanted to just kind of point out, if you, if you look at Nauset Regional, um, you know, Nauset Regional's expenditures are, you know, 9.3% higher than, than Monomoy's. Um, if, if ours, you know, if our, you know, per pupil was, uh, it was that much, this would be a, a budget that would be $3.7 million more. And that, and, you know, if you look at that, that's, you know, the, they have a school district that doesn't have sort of a unified, uh, you know, fully unified where the elementary schools are part of it. So, you know, by having that different model, you know, the per pupil expenditures for the, you know, for the students that are in grades K through five, uh, there are significantly more than what the regional school district is. So, you know, so, you know, this is, if you, if you really look at the education we're providing, um, it's a great education and it's, it's relatively speaking a great value for the taxpayers. If you look at the education expenditures as a percent of town budgets, and we need to kind of keep in mind here that one of the big drivers behind something like this is you know, how many you know how many families do you have living in the community with school age you know, with school age children you know so you'll see that you know that Chatham ends up being you know, sort of at the bottom you know you know close to the bottom of this list with you know with only Provincetown um, you know below it and and uh, you know Truro just you know just above it. Um, you know, Harwich, you know, falls in between, uh, between Brewster and, and Bourne in terms of, of the percent of the town's budget expended on, expended on education. But again, it's, it, it, it's the demographics of a community that really dictate, um, you know, dictate that. All right, uh, one of the things that we have been doing each year is just updating our five-year plan and just sharing with our two towns you know, what, you know, what we can anticipate out there uh, in terms of budget. So you know, we, looked, you know, we have looked at you know, how have we tracked since we've, you know, since we've, come, you know, since we've come together as a district. Um, you know, so we've, you know, we've, been tracking, you know, we've been tracking along fairly, you know, fairly well in our initial five-year plan looking at as we looked out into the future. Um, if we look from this year going forward, we're really uh, looking at budgets that, you know, that are going to be in that, that four, you know, uh, you know, 
you know, that four to um, you know, four and a half percent range. Um, again, uh, emphasizing that hopefully some of this can be offset by other factors, and that's one of the things that we have done in this budget is <coughs> use excess and deficiency to help, you know, to help push that, you know, the assessment down because assessment is different than what the, you know, in the budget. Um, as we go into our meetings with our, both of our towns, and I talked at Harwich about this this, this past week, uh, there's the want uh, to create a stabilization account for the school district. And last year, a year ago, when we were giving our budget presentation, we had said, when we come back before you this year, we'll talk about the need for stabilization and that the only way we can form a stabilization account is to actually fund it in the budget. So there's $50,000 earmarked in this budget to create an account that gives the school district a reserve that it can go to if there is a future capital unexpected need. You know, so if middle of the school year we have a rooftop unit just goes kaput and suddenly we need to bring in a contractor and, and replace a really expensive rooftop unit that wasn't planned for in the budget, there's an account that we can go to for something that you would borrow. Or if we look at this stabilization over the long haul, kind of like excess and deficiency, if we grow stabilization, uh, we can get to a place that we've, we've talked uh, at our, you know, to our select boards and finance committees about in the future needing to replace a roof on one building or, or, or another. If we continue to grow a stabilization account uh, when it comes time to replace that roof, we can buffer the cost of the, you know, the project. We might even be able to pay for the entire project out of stabilization instead of seeing one year, well, you know, we're putting a roof of a building into a budget, but hopefully being able to pay for it out of this account because we're, you know, we're future planning. So, to, you know, so a stabilization account is one that you can uh, yeah, that you can use for things that you have, uh, that you can borrow for, is sort of the, a, a good conceptual way to think about it. Um, to create the account, uh, we have to vote to create the account here at the school committee, and we have to go to both of our select boards and have them vote separately to allow us to create the stabilization account. Um, so, uh, you know, so again, it starts with a vote here, uh, it goes to both select boards, we then, in the process of developing the FY19 budget, fund a line item. So we have funded this with a line of $50,000. And the concept is, if all of those things happen, uh, that $50,000 would be there for, uh, for a, a reserve if we had an unexpected capital cost. And it's something that we could grow over time to help buffer our two towns when it comes to those types of, of needs. So uh, last slide up here, uh, because I know people want me to stop talking, uh, is uh, just where we are uh, in this. So we are on Monday uh, going before the Chatham Board of Selectmen and uh, Finance Committee to, uh, to give this presentation. I, I offered uh, Corey the chance to tell me how many slides I need to cut this down to <laughs> for Monday night, um, or I could spend uh, the first hour of their meeting uh, giving this presentation all over again. I'll leave that to the chair. I'll stop for any questions. Any questions from the committee? I, I just have, um, on the projections for the um, five years, um, how do you factor in the health insurance there? Kitty, do you want to talk about what you use? <laughs> Kitty Isernio, business manager. So what we did with the, doing the projections is going back and averaging out the costs over the prior five years and averaging them at, and then adding the percentages going forward at a minimum 6% and to 8%. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. <laughs> it's a projection. <laughs> Any other questions? Any questions from the public? Wow, really? Nothing? Hmm. Any other questions or should we, we can. move on to our... 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please, come. You have to come up to the microphone. And if you could just state your name for please. Charles Gruska, 6 Tberry Ave in Harwich. Um, and grandparent of two students who are in the Monmoy Middle School on school choice, uh, living in Brewster with an opportunity. Does the public have an opportunity to make comments about the, the budget presentation as opposed yes. to questions? Um, I would just say, and, and, and um, my comments are, are based on having been a career public educator for 34 years in the Wachusett Regional School District, which is the first and largest, still largest district, uh, regional school district, and a resident of Worcester, and having been involved in budgets for a, a long, long time, and 24 of those years were spent as a school principal, and the budget is critical to the work uh, on the lines. Um, my perspective is I have tremendous enthusiasm. I've, I've only lived in town here for three years officially, visited since 1971. But three years ago, Monday, I purchased the home in, in Harwich. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. My, uh, parent, my wife's parents uh, lived in West Harwich since 1971, so I have a lot of background. We love the community. The children, two of the grandchildren moved up from Texas a year and a half ago, started in Monomoy because they were living with us, bought a home in Brewster, had the option to go to Nauset, but have chosen um, Monomoy. And I'm I've had an opportunity to learn a lot about the schools. I've served as a community volunteer for the high school NIAS tenure accreditation. Um, that's put me in the building for a long, t uh, quite a few hours. I've had an opportunity to meet with the administrators. Uh, I find the total administration tremendously receptive and welcoming. Um, and I just had, and, and some of the programs that are being established and adjusted are, are phenomenal. I'm not used to seeing a budget, from my experience, that meets class size needs like this proposed budget does. I'm, I'm used to fighting at public hearings on budget, fighting at town meetings for budgets that get school systems out of the range of 27 and above students in elementary classrooms in the community that I moved here from. In the community that in the district I worked in, 25 was considered a reasonable class size. And when I hit the 26 student in my classroom, I was at the superintendent's office saying, this is, we've got to do something about it. And if that didn't work, usually parents were at the superintendent's office and at the school committee, and then something would happen. So seeing what this budget enables the school system to do and has been enabling to do from my perspective um, based on seeing what other school systems are dealing with this is an this is an excellent tight but excellent budget um, there are some things that are called for for improvements in this budget that i would urge the committee to strongly stand behind um, the the technology needs the robotics needs that were <coughs> mentioned as a growth area my uh, two grandchildren have experienced the program at the middle school. You had a wonderful presentation that I was at a couple of months ago by the teachers. I know from being here at the high school and the NIASC work, um, interacting with the teachers here in the technology department, uh, they need that material to continue the effort. The presentation that I saw on social emotional learning you are, uh, we are on the cutting edge at Monomoy in that area. And I am tremendously proud and enthused as a taxpayer and as a grandparent to see the efforts that uh, Ms. McGuire and the entire staff are putting together there. And I think that the, the needs are critical uh, to support uh, in, in the growth that's needed there. Uh, my, part of my background was as a school counselor and special needs teacher. And uh, prior to becoming an administrator, the need for additional adjustment counselors and balancing the workload between uh, school evaluation team coordinators and adjustment counselors. We need to maximize uh, counselors who specifically do counseling and work with families and, and students. So I would just comment that I would hope what, whatever the budget has to happen to it down the road, I would love to see that as a priority area to maintain in this projected budget. Um, the social emotional learning, one of the exciting things, um, Ms. McGuire has been very good. I expressed uh, questions about the 
more information about the program. She's invited me to work on the steering committee, but one of the things I see is some parents, uh, programs specifically for parents. One of the um, big things that school systems everywhere are missing out on is the fact that the home and family environment, from my research and my work, tells me that's the most significant factor when it comes to academic achievement, school performance, social adjustment. Um, and most communities are neglecting doing things for parents. Uh, I see specific programs for parents built into the social emotional learning plan of the district. And I see you know, a request to expand and support that, that growth here within the budget. So um, I just want to, uh, and, and the other thing I want to share with you is that I have found in my experience here at the high school, that I've, I've been tremendously pleased or surprised actually by how welcoming everyone in the school community has been to me from the minute I first walked in the door for the first meeting not knowing this building, not knowing what I was heading into, the office staff and the way I was greeted and treated, Principal Burkhead and his welcoming me when I came in the room. I thought I was going to, how am I going to break in to talk to anybody that I've never met here in this huge faculty? I was immediately welcomed and I've had the experience of being continuously welcomed um, and, I have act and I've worked with the faculty and see they're tremendously professional. They're not only dedicated to the efforts in the classroom in their specific areas, but they are dedicated to the mission of the school and they're dedicated, and even this NIASC thing, which in many communities for many people on a faculty is one big pain in the neck, has good purposes, but it's a lot of work outside of what you specifically wanted to do and came into education to do working with the kids. They have taken an amazing attitude. The, the staff is so supportive of one another. I've had the same experience at the middle school. Um, the principal, assistant principal have been very welcoming, very opening to talk. Tremendous music programs at both schools. I'm a <laughs> lifetime musician that blows me away. I hope you'd never do anything to cut back uh, ever in, in that area. I'm amazed at what the students can do and their capabilities. I'm a member of the Chatham Harwich Newcomers Club, 650 seniors, mostly retired taxpayers who don't have, for the most part, children uh, in the school. Many of them attended the uh, concert, the holiday concert here at the building. For many, it was their first time in the building and it was their first time hearing a school performance. And I can't tell, there were over 80 members, I believe, in attendance. And I can't believe the talk afterwards about the, the facility, first of all, because it was the first time in the building for many of them who support it with the taxes but don't have children in the school and the capabilities of the students um, through the tremendous performance put on through the leadership of your music personnel. Um, and you've also done a great thing last meeting, changing the social studies curriculum to bring in uh, government and civics in the eighth grade as a requirement. Um, that's an area where a lot of educators that I speak to have been very concerned. In this, in this age of accountability, a um, couple of areas have been lost track of. Everything has become academics and the three major areas that are tested for accountability. And what has been lost in many cases has been the other part, the human component. Competence is well taken care of, but caring and getting along well with and caring about others. That's why the social emotional component is so important in the budget. And also, all the subject areas that are not, are not in the accountability testing, social studies among them have taken a back, tended to take a back seat as the focus has become on what are our scores, how are our scores doing, how are our scores doing in relation to other communities. Um, one of the big concerns uh, many people that I've spoken to have had is we have no way to measure because there's no accountability how well could our students who graduate from the high school measure up against people who are taking the natural, the civics portion of the naturalization test to become citizens of our country? Shouldn't we want to be assured that our students shouldn't, would know as much graduating from high school as you would need to know to be, become a citizen in the country? I thought that move was a major step uh, last week. It's not something that's necessarily budget related, but it, it re reflects in the quality and, 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 and cutting edge vision of the school district 
that I've perceived in a short time here at the school. And believe me, I've been a major critic of schools and school systems when I've seen inadequacies in those school systems. I've not found anything as a taxpayer, as a former educator, as a grandparent of two children in the system. And I'm thrilled my grandson will be in the eighth grade next year, so he'll be in that first group to have the, the civics um, program and the government program, which is beautifully laid out. Um, but I have not found anything that I could take the system to task with. I am very happy that they have made, the, my grandchildren's family made the decision to school choice into, into Monomoy. And I am very thrilled when I see a budget that's, that supports the, the growth, the continuation of the programs and of the class sizes, which you would find to be the envy of, of many school systems. I feel my tax dollars are, are being well spent. So I just wanted to share that for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can come up anytime. <laughs> <laughs> that, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Russell. Uh, I echo that. It's not that often that a Holy Cross grad makes my night. <laughs> uh, I, uh, in this, what a wonderful way to deliver constructive criticism. So, uh, nice boost. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right. Any other final questions, comments from anyone? Ms. Richardson. Um, I, I, too, commend this budget it, it's awesome and I just not sure how to get the word out that the health insurance is a part of this budget where it isn't for the other t um, part departments that's my but th that's all I wanted to say that the, the health mm -hmm. insurance is a chunk of it and anyway thank you all right and somebody would like to entertain a motion to adjourn our public hearing in a second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, so our public hearing is adjourned at 7.07. .07. And we'll take a brief moment, don't get up, just to pass out our folders. This is going to go until 10. Do you need a brief moment? No, seriously, do you need a brief moment? Stand up and stretch. I'm freezing. Oh, I have a fur. Nancy, just rent my car for a minute. I have a fur.
approval of the January 25th minutes. Entertain a motion. So move. And a second. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The motion carries. And next up is public comment. Seeing none, we will move on to recognitions with Mr. Carpenter. I have a few. Um, first, I would like to um, uh, compliment uh, our uh, Harvard Elementary School nurse, uh, Mrs. Fioco, and uh, one of our teachers, Ms. Cronin, who we got a wonderful letter of uh, just commendation from the Harwich Police Department, uh, just uh, thanking them for how they handled a medical emergency at the, at the elementary school. So uh, thank you to Carol and Aaron. Uh, in terms of donations, I'd like to thank the Harwich Cultural Council uh, for a donation of $350 to support the middle school uh, language of dance program for seventh graders and uh, for the Chatham Cultural Council uh, for a donation of $150 uh, for the middle school <coughs> to also support the language of dance program for seventh graders and then uh, for uh, Sharon Mabel, uh, Mabel uh, a donation of $500 to the Harwich Elementary Cafeteria uh, for families in need. And I would like to uh, turn over recognitions to Sharon for a moment. Ms. up. Well, we had um, two important men in the Harwich community that recently died. One has gotten a lot of um, right up in the newspaper, Jimmy Marceline, and um, he was he was quite a town father to lots of people and lots of families in the Harwich community, renting to people at under the market rate for rent. And most everyone knows about uh, his donation or a huge contribution of the land or most of the land for the tech school, but People may not know as much how much he uh, advocated for children in the Harwich school systems, um, especially when we were talking about things like computers. Um, it wasn't really his bailiwick, but he could see the importance of it for our school children. So um, the town has given him a lot of recognition. And then today was the funeral for Don Nesmith, who was a principal of Harwich um, Elementary School for about 28 years. And um, if you're on social media, you might come across a whole lot of outpouring from people of um, different fondnesses they had for um, Mr. Nesmith when he was principal. It was a kinder, more simpler time, and it's some very nice feelings. So just wanted to mention those people. Thank you, I appreciate that. Any other recognitions? All right, seeing none, we will move into reports and discussions. And first up is a booster presentation from Mr. Evans. Hello. Hello Beth. How are you? Good. As someone who went through the naturalization process. <laughs> <laughs> that is no fun. <laughs> Actually, I used to terrify my uh, employees at a company I worked with in the D.C. area when I was going through it by walking around and spot quizzing them. <laughs> <laughs> I was not very popular. <laughs> um, Simon Evans from uh, Harwich, from Panorama Point Drive. I uh, have one daughter who's a sophomore and one son who is now an alumni um, at Roger Williams University as a freshman. Uh, so I am the president of the Monomoyal Sports Booster Club. Uh, it has been in existence for a grand total of about a year. Uh, we founded it about December 2016, we fully incorporated at that time, and began on a journey of discovery because we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, but despite that, we've, in the last 12 months, been able to raise something in the realms of $30,000 for the students, student athletes, teams, uh, and obviously are looking to continue to build upon that and grow uh, with the intent really of boosting school spirit and community involvement and spirit around the, the school and using the school sports as a vehicle really to do that. 
Um, and what we've realized over this sort of 12-month journey is that one of the key things that we have to do is identify recurring revenue streams. Um, we're not inundated with volunteers. <laughs> um, we would love to be, but we're not, and that's just a reality, I think, of busy lives that we all have these days. So we have focused on establishing a few more significant fundraising activities, um, and the first one that we have that uh, at the beginning of the school year, so to speak, is actually around Columbus Day. We did this last year, and it's now going to be a recurring thing, which is a golf event at Cranberry Valley. Uh, we are holding it on Columbus Day each day, each, each year. That's our goal, so that it's easy to remember. Uh, we stood up our first event. It was a mad scramble, a bit chaotic, but we still raised $7,500. Uh, we're confident that now we know what we're doing a little bit more, uh, we'll double that, if not more, next year. Uh, and certainly any golfers, just let us know. We'd love to have you come and be part of the foursome or whatever. Uh, but it was a great fun event. Uh, we tied that in with a silent auction as well. The other, uh, one of the other activities that we do, I have a copy here, we sell shark cards. It costs 20 bucks, and they have about $300 worth of savings from local area businesses. So it's a great little fundraiser. We get we split the cost with the firm that manufactures these. Um, again, we were learning as we went, but we still raised over well, around $5,000 with that particular initiative. We're gonna try and move it to be the winter fundraiser for us this go around because it, we did it around the same time as the golf and it was a little chaotic, but we'll, we'll learn as we go on that. And then the final major fundraiser that we've had so far and is coming up for our second annual one on April 8th, Sunday, April 8th, is our mattress fundraiser, which is always confusing to everybody at first. Um, basically what happens is there's a professional fundraising firm with CFS. They come in, they take over the gym for a day, and they turn it into a pop-up retail store selling top brand mattresses, pillows, and apparently this year, uh, high-end linens as well. Uh, they are typically 30 to 50 percent below retail because they don't have retail infrastructure costs. You come in, they have 29 different beds, you check them out with different sizes, choose mattress, you buy the mattress, um, they will deliver it within a couple of weeks uh, to your home and every one of those that sells, we make money. Uh, every pillar that sells, we make money. Every uh, piece of linen, we will make money. Uh, last year, the very first time we had done it, we raised over $11,000. And to give you perspective, that's about twice what Norset raised. Uh, just like to say that. Uh, <laughs> not that we're in competition. Um, and, our, and our kids had a great time with it because it's set up so they get things as well. Uh, and it was about $1,800 worth of stuff that our kids were able to walk out with as a result of getting people just through referrals. And there's, there's like a little card that they have them fill out and it has their name on it and if, if based upon how many <coughs> batches are sold for that person, they got money, they got gifts. One kid walked out with a 50 inch TV. So it's a great program. We're gonna do that again. Our goal is to hit 15,000 this year. I think we're gonna do it. Uh, and then the fourth thing that we're doing right now is a, uh, with where the uh, bathroom uh, building is, we're going to put out a sort of brick area when we will sell bricks that you can buy and have inscribed. And there will also be pavers for if someone wants to spend a bit more on a 12 by 12 paver where they can also have it, a bit like they have over at the rec center. So that will be a great lasting opportunity for people to recognize you know, their kid, the school, the team, whatever they want to do. And it will, and it will be in the, on that brick uh, walk, and, and that's part of the, the plan that we've got to, to do that. We've already spoken to a firm that will do it for us, so we're gonna start rolling that out in the near term. So those are the recurring revenue streams that we've identified so far. What I wanted to just put on the table were a couple of others that we felt it was appropriate to come to the school committee about um, and get your consideration and, and hopeful support. One of those, which is a common enough thing that's done in many of the sporting areas and many of the schools in this area, is to do a 50-50 lottery at the football games. So that we would, like they do at the Mariners, you know, go there, sell lottery tickets, 
you have various prizes that would be donated and the 50-50 for the split of the, the money. We've researched it. We understand the requirements in terms of uh, the approval from the town that we need to get, the approval from the Lottery Commission at the state level. Um, we know that 5% has to go to the Lottery Commission. So we feel comfortable that we know all the various steps that we need to do from that point of view. But it is something that can be perceived as, you know, maybe not necessarily a direct school thing, which is why perhaps a, the Booster Club taking care of it is a better way to do it. But it would be a great way to raise money for, uh, for the initiative. And then the final thing we wanted to talk about, and we would like to work with the school committee and the school about, was the idea of selling some signage around the main field for local area businesses. A great visual way for them to show their support for our school sports. Um, it would be something presumably we would do with an annual contract so that they can choose to re-up the next year or if they don't, we sell that space to somebody else. Um, I think we would need to establish some appropriate parameters, both in terms of size of signage, maybe types of firms that would be appropriate. Uh, you know, I would leave that to the group, but we wanted to just at least put that out there and seek um, at least consideration for doing that as a way, again, of providing that recurring revenue stream. Um, and a couple of things we're trying to do <coughs> with the money that we're making, um, we, we already give funds to school teams uh, for extra funded non-budgetary needs um, that goes, um, golf team last year got to state and they were going to be playing an unfamiliar golf course. So we paid for them to, paid for them to have a practice round. You know, small things like that, but you know, we can do other things as well. Um, we also are looking into and, and expect to establish scholarships for uh, some of the student athletes, probably looking to try and do a couple, one boy, one girl, for each season um, that, of the three seasons that we have. So it would be a total of six scholarships. Um, and we would use dollar for scholars, scholars for dollars, whatever, uh, <laughs> to, to manage that, that process with us. So we're looking into doing that uh, and really looking at different ways that we can create team spirit. One thing that we have been doing is at the end of every um, season, we give all the student athletes something, whether it's long sleeve shirts, t-shirts, bags, so, and they have the Monomoy logo on them, and they have the Monomoy All Sports Booster logo on them, and it's great because we see the kids around the school wearing them. We wondered at first whether they were going to frown upon something like that. They wear them all the time. Uh, and it's just another <coughs> way of promoting the school, building that school spirit. So that's basically it. Uh, would uh, welcome any questions. Any questions for Mr. Evans? Ms. Dove. I have a comment. I'm thrilled at all this effort that's going in, especially since there's not a wealth of people volunteering. So I really um, am thrilled about all that. The two things that you mentioned at the end, um, it's my thought that would need to go through the policy committee. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? Just thank you very much for all your efforts. Oh, you're very welcome. It's not, trust me, it's not just me. <laughs> There's a great group of, as I said, maybe small, but a good group of uh, parents that are very engaged in trying to do this. And uh, <coughs> hopefully see everybody on April the 8th to buy mattresses. <laughs> Mr. Carpenter? I, I, I would agree with Sharon um, on the, I, I actually don't think that the, I, I don't think that the raffle piece is one that we need to, go through the policy uh, subcommittee, but I do think the advertising, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it, I think it would be up to the school committee whether or not you want to do some sort of formal vote at some point to just, you know, I, it, it may support Simon in going forward to the select board to say that there's support from the school committee to, uh, to hold raffles here. Um, and then, you know, with their Nonprofit status, they can go through and, and manage all that paperwork. I think it's a, I think it's a good thing, and it's it's something that uh, I, I know as superintendent, I've had uh, many times. You have parents saying, "Well, why can't we do that when we go away to a sporting event at another school and there's a like group that's uh, that's doing the raffle?" So I think that's I, I'd fully support it. I would agree with Sharon on the uh, 
on the need for a policy, and I'm, I'm happy to go do some, some research on some policies that other districts have and you know, sort of send that to the, uh, to the policy subcommittee to hopefully kind of get quicker action on so that they can get launched because I, I, I suspect that, that the optimal season is to you know, have things in place by the beginning of football yep. season next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so it's important that we go give them the time to find those community partners. But I, 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 I was in a former district where they, uh, I, I think my committee was, didn't want to see any sort of advertisement. And I, I've been to many communities where there's advertisement there. And I do think that, that it does start to speak about those school community partnerships. And it's something I personally am very much in support of. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so what we would need to do, we want to put something on the agenda for our next meeting to discuss the options of doing 50-50 raffles. Have a head nod, a general consensus to have that discussion mm -hmm. at the next meeting. And then we can also add on there um, the discussion of whether or not we send to the policy subcommittee something for advertisements on the field. So we can put that on our next agenda and maybe Mr. Carpenter can have some some rough ideas. I, I would actually agree that it would be, I could see benefits to having the banners from the different businesses. Yeah. You know, it shows that they support us, we support them. Right. You know, it's. Yeah, and it's almost done appropriately. Uh, tastefully, yeah. yes. yes. exactly. You look, you look for it tastefully, you don't need yeah. gaudy looking don't things. Flashing but, lights. Right, <laughs> flashing lights would be bad. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for your You're efforts, welcome. and thank you for coming and sharing all that with us. No problem. Thank you. And next, we move up to Mr. Burkhead's Monterey Regional High School Program of Studies for 2018-2019. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bill Burkhead, Principal of Monterey Regional High School, and I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Mr. Groska for those kind words about our district from a uh, very well-respected educator. Um, I also want to thank him for uh, putting in several hours of his own time volunteering for our NES committees along with six other uh, community members. It's very important to um, have community input and to have knowledgeable background. Uh, people in the education field has been extremely helpful and appreciated, so thank you. I also want to thank Mr. Evans for um, leading our booster club. As he stated, it's uh, one year uh, in, and already you've heard the multitude of events sponsored and organized by our booster club, the dedicated parents that all volunteer above and beyond their regular lives to, to do this, raise money for our kids. So um, thank you, Mr. Evans, for doing that. And uh, I did purchase a, a bed last year at, at the mattress sale. It is awesome. And, uh, <laughs> I only had one kid in college, and now I have two, so when you said fine linens, I just can't tell my wife or that's another two grand. <laughs> so, that would be a problem, but I, I plan on attending this year, so thanks for all you do. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the program of studies. Before I get to that, I'd just like to share some good news and some uh, one of the more innovative things I think we're doing at Monomoy High School that's great for our kids. And um, it involves our core values and our 21st century learning expectations that we created last year as a community, students, staff, uh, parents, guardians, and community, and they're very impressive. But they're only impressive if you put them to use and then measure if the students are actually learning them. So I think that after having them for one year, we're already into the phase now where we're going to pilot measuring them. And the students received a, an email tonight, and it will be in tomorrow's Friday Focus that I believe you all get to, to see, but if you don't, please let me know, and I'll make sure you all get that emailed out. And the email refers parents to that. And instead of the traditional progress report um, that majority of schools, including my own children's schools, used to use, uh, including Monomoy up until now, with the canned statements of is a pleasure to have in class or works well with others that you ask yourself as a parent, well, what does that really mean? You know, I know I have a nice kid, but that doesn't really tell me what skills they have or what we can work on in any depth. So what we'll be doing now is we have a rubric that we've shared with parents and community members and everybody, and the students, of course, and we'll be measuring that with, through assessments uh, over time to see how our kids grow in their 21st learning expectations. So it's not, and that will be academic 
social and civic responsibilities. Something very innovative, not many schools are doing it. So I hope you can check that out and I'd be uh, interested to hear your feedback on that. We'll certainly be asking parents and students their feedback. We had town hall meetings this, year, uh, this last week with our students by grade. I shared that with them, went over the expectations. They've heard it before. Our teachers will do it in depth in classrooms. But we feel it's so much more important. Uh, I think Mr. Gruska talked about the whole child. Um, you know, that it's not just one test we'll measure our kids on. It's a multitude of skill development that when our kids leave Montemoy, this is what we expect them to have and be able to do. And so now we'll be able to measure that. We'll be able to assess our school as a whole, and I'll be able to pro provide you some data on that and what we'll do to make sure that those numbers continue to increase and our kids, you know, learn at high levels. So that's that. I, I hope you enjoy that. I know we're excited about it. So our program of studies, a program of studies is um, a reflection of your, your values. Um, the courses you offer your students, the opportunities, and we're extremely proud of ours in the fourth year now, and I'll put them up against any other school um, in regards to the, uh, the, the high level of expectations, the amount of opportunities, the number of courses, uh, and the, just the diverse um, opportunities we have. I was talking to a few principals recently and about their schedules and what they do, and you know a lot of them are still uh, offering simply just full-year courses. Uh, we've moved to semester courses uh, years ago in our first years to have them. And it's much more complicated. It's not as easy to schedule, but it's better for kids. So I think that's kind of our mindset. And as we've grown over four years, all of our decisions are based on what's best for the kids and what's not more convenient for us to schedule. And sometimes that's hard, but it's necessary. The good news is that now in year four, the changes we need to make are uh, smaller but they're more focused and more impactful, we believe. And so tonight we're gonna to share with you simply the changes. You have a copy of our program of studies. We'd be happy to uh, invite you in to have a coffee and to sit with myself and uh, our co-chairs of our, our uh, program of studies and scheduling committee at any time to kind of explain the nuances of a schedule or the program of studies or how we um, move this to the actual schedule to actually where kids sit in classes. It's a, it's a pretty compre comprehensive and complex problem uh, process that we'd be happy to simplify over a coffee and share with you at any time. Uh, but tonight we're gonna highlight uh, just the uh, changes. A lot of it stayed the same from last year because we're, again, we're in, in year four, we're, we're uh, in a good place where <coughs> things that, are, that we have in place now that did not change are, either, are working. Uh, and that means they're either uh, expected to, for us to, to teach from the state as graduation requirements, uh, <coughs> or students have shown us with their feet, with their choices uh, and electives uh, what they have decided is important and what they've taken over time. The data has shown us that those classes um, run because students are interested in them. So that has given us enough opportunity to hone our skills on some of the things you'll see tonight. So I'm going to turn it over now to um, the co-chairs of the committee who have done a lot of work on this. Uh, Mr. Martin, our assistant principal, uh, and, and Ms. Police, our director of guidance. Hello again. So we pretty much have a slide for each department. Um, and again, we're focusing on the changes. So uh, let us get through the slides. And if you want to hold questions until the end, and we'll try and field them rather than have questions after each slide. So uh, I want to start off by saying that um, every department is represented except for wellness, which is reflective in that they had um, no changes to their, to their offerings this year. So for English language arts, we really just tightened up some of the semester electives um, and we removed uh, Shakespeare, Irish Lit, and some of the other offerings that we've tried to run over the last four years and just the student interest has kind of waned. And I know for all four of those choices up there, they are reflected in um, either British literature or American literature. So I think some of the students might think there's a little redundancy there. Uh, Brand new is playwriting and screenwriting um, as a semester elective this year for ELA. As I spoke about last week, our big change is the move to uh, civics and government in the eighth grade, uh, and that will replace World One. And also a name change, I think it's just to um, have a little more cachet, is we ran a Hawthorne <coughs> to Hoffman class 
Um, we didn't really get any takers last year as part of our global studies program, so we changed it to really reflect what it is, uh, and it's called hands-on art history. Didn't run last year. Okay, for math, uh, the big change is in the foundations of math. So we're going to be running uh, three sections um, of foundations of math, and that really replaces uh, foundations of algebra, foundations of geometry, foundations of, of algebra two, which uh, were different courses in of themselves. So it gives us a lot more flexibility uh, for students. Um, you can see the, those. Um, the Foundations of Math class is really focusing on remediation and MCAS prep, and this is going to run in conjunction with the, the math class that, uh, that we'll be taking. Uh, also, the statistics, probability, and discrete topic in math, it is reflective, it's a name change, and it replaces what's currently in this year's um, POS's discrete math. So science, technology, and engineering, we do have a change from AP Physics that replaces our Honors Physics. The big change is really in our engineering offerings as we're moving uh, towards a more engineering-based track and in kind of keeping it with what's going on at the middle school as far as the robotics program. Uh, we've really moved away from some of the traditional uh, you know, we had some woodshop stuff going on, but now we're really focused on this uh, more robotics, more programming, and more engineering and technology. Uh, for our world language program, um, currently French, uh, AP French and French 4 uh, run together. We are um, separating them so that they run separately. Um, <coughs> Also, we are looking for any students that want to do an independent study in any world language that will be available every year. But really, AP is going to um, be determined by student request that year. So if we do have a cohort of kids that do want to take an AP class rather than it be an independent study, if we have seven or eight kids, you know, we're going to have them in front of a teacher. Again, a couple of name changes here. Um, advanced Portfolio Art uh, is now replacing what was called Portfolio, portfolio Art 2 through 8, and the Advanced Digital Media um, replaces the uh, Advanced Study and TV Production. Uh, for special education, we had a couple of vocational community programs, and to me those you know, sound fairly Really sterile. So we're we're trying to you know use our we're trying to use our our coastal location and come up with um, something a little more catchy. So our shore program students have opportunities for recreation and employment replaces the vocational community program for 18 to 22 population. Uh, same with our sail program. Um, it replaces the 8th through uh, 12th grade community vocation program and our sand program. Uh, we're really looking. Um, as a, a venue focused on students with anxiety and social and emotional um, concerns. Um, these are not something that a student can select. This is based on, um, uh, determined by uh, IEP uh, meetings. I think that's us. So we will field questions at this time. Questions so, for the dynamic duo, Ms. Dell. Um, on your, um, I noticed that one of the courses was changed from an honors to an AP. Mm -hmm. um, are there courses that are presented, I was familiar with some other towns, where they'll have like an honors and an AP in the same classroom, but they'll have different requirements. For some, do we do that at all? Um, we, we moved to the physics track last school year, mm -hmm. and the reason why you see the honors physics 11 and 12, those students never experienced physics, which is why we ran it. Mm -hmm. This is the last year that we need to run it, so all students will cycle through either CP physics or honors in the, in the ninth grade. 
So there's no need for it in the 11th and 12th grade because they've all had it. So the AP Physics 1 is an algebra-based an algebra science class, so more students are eligible for it versus the AP Physics C, which is a calculus-based class. Well, I'm not sure I've got that all, but... Uh, <laughs> So there's, there's, there's no need for the honors at the 11th and 12th grade because they have it in the 9th grade. Okay. Um, and other things that don't mystify me as much as <laughs> physics. Um, like, I was aware, I worked with um, somebody in the NASET system year, several years ago when they were taking um, some foreign language. And I know in the classroom they had honors and they had AP at the time and it was just a way to accommodate something that they might have had to make a choice one way or the other and I don't know all the pros and cons it sounds like a pro to do that to me but I'm not we're actually know. running AP Latin and honors Latin together this year as well as French and I think to speak to what you said, yes, it gives kids an opportunity. I think it's a challenge too. Um, I think we're looking to separate them out so the AP will run every other year. And the AP numbers are, are relatively low. So if it's one or two students, it, it makes more sense to have them do it on a, as an independent study. Okay. But if we have six, seven, or eight, we're gonna separate those out. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Mr. Russell. A question on the science, technology, and engineering. <laughs> so seriously, I, I uh, being a fellow Brocktonian, I, I had metalwork and woodshop. <laughs> oh. And thank God they didn't have a summer school for me, because <laughs> none, none of my projects got to, I wasn't able to take them home. <laughs> so this is a great transition. My question is kind of a simple one. Within the, within the budget going from wood, in metal, which in the old days that I can remember, a fairly decent budget that I had to build out. That this does this impact uh, a budget impact increase because of uh, the robotics, et cetera, et cetera. And I would imagine you guys have planned on that. It's, it's in our strategic yeah. initiative uh, on one of those slides. I think there's. A it's on the initiative, the strategic plan that I've read so many times. And I, <laughs> I think there's a. I do. It's, it's one yeah. of the items so in one our budget. One support it. It was on a slide tonight. That you read a lot. Thank you. Slide. Yes, I just wanted these folks to tell me that. But, you know, oh, slide you know, there's a TD audience. Taken care of. Hundreds out there. <laughs> we got this for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but I also want to, I want to toot the horn of our teachers because we've got two dynamic new teachers that are doing this curriculum and bringing this to the next level. I think it's been said to coordinate nicely um, vertically with the middle school so the kids come seamlessly into the high school with it. And you don't see that in a lot of districts where we have such a strong middle school technology and engineering program, they come into the high school within two new folks we hired, highly skilled in this area, though they'll be doing that. They've already written grants and received money to start getting some of these things like 3D printers and things they need. So, uh, you know, we're hoping for the budget and that's great, but we're not, you know, waiting for that. We're already, we want the kids this year to get a flavor for that. So they've already started doing that through grant writing and, you know, going out and hustling and trying to find money for the kids doing online courses that are free and this kind of stuff. So. Um, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, fellow sitting here, it's truly one of those paradigm shifts within a curricula that goes from metal and wood, which was traditional for years, to something that will uh, is beyond the beyond. Yeah, and I think um, we still think it's important, metal and wood, to use your hands. Um, we don't want to strictly go away from working with <coughs> hands, so we do. There's some classes in here that include what we call maker spaces, which are you know kids kids do make things with their hands a variety of things, a lot of things can be individualized that they can come up with through scraps or things in the room that they'll have to make a goal, design it and make it. So it's just using different materials maybe, but it's still the same critical thinking that you have to be able to build something and put something together so that kids can go out and be able to do that if they so choose. Higher level things that if they want to go that route is the, the higher level of robotics and engineering so that we will be able to send kids through our new Physics First program in combination with this technology to schools like MIT and Wentworth and R RTI. Great job. RTI, Other questions? Ms. Dow. Um, I, I love some of these changes in the, um, 
the special education and some of the other ones because I think it's um, not just more alive but more positive of what we're going for. So um, I haven't thought about that at all, but I think that's great. I appreciated um, the comments last time about that the civics that's going to happen in 8th grade won't impact at all what's happening in 12th grade, that those will be kept distinct. So personally, I have an interest in um, a couple of different things, but one of them is that when our students, and this isn't really about Monomoy, we just happened to be here at Monomoy discussing it, that I'm not sure how, I guess I'm seeing a lot of people that are having lots of personal finance problems. They don't, when the in invention of the credit card came in and you got things and then had to pay for it instead of the other way around, it's created a problem for people. So I, I will take you up on that and come in and try to meet and see what we're doing for that because I, I do have a concern about that. Thank you very much for your offer. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions for the now dynamic trio? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bill, I, I'd like to point out that I, I think you won the bet by a oh. minute and 15 <laughs> seconds, including <laughs> questions. Good, I'll turn the heat back on. That's <laughs> <laughs> what it is. That's funny. <laughs> All right, we will move on to Mr. Carpenter's superintendent's goals progress and an update on those. Um, we were supposed to have a update and a mid-cycle discussion um, but after our workshop prior to our last meeting <laughs> with Ms. Presser from MASC, we wanted to try to get the subcommittee back together to kind of fine tune what we were going to be asking the full committee to do. And since we haven't done that, uh, we just asked Mr. Carpenter to just kind of give an up update, brief update of his progress of the goals that we approved this past fall. <coughs> this will be really brief. Uh, for those of you that didn't remember the, what my goals were, I just passed them back out. Uh, you know, the first was uh, uh, about uh, uh, finishing the dissertation, which, um, knock on wood, I defend the dissertation on the 20th. Um, so if I don't come back after that, no, no. <laughs> no, so so, um, so uh, that's, you know, and I, I have. Uh, I've appreciated the support my advisor's been, uh, been providing, so I, I do a trial run of my defense next week, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll see how the 20th goes. So knock on, knock on wood by our next school committee meeting, that will all be behind me. Um, and the other thing that will, that will happen at our next school committee meeting is that we'll start a series of presentations. It'll probably be the second school committee each month uh, that's, that's really related to everything else in this set of in this set of goals, I, um, this week we have been uh, going through uh, the interview process for the future uh, director of curriculum instruction and assessment. And I thought I, I thought one of the nicest compliments that one of the candidates made that uh, that came in to interview with us was talking about how how you know, well aligned our school improvement plans are with the strategic plan and, and we're able to kind of see from outside that sort of alignment. Um, so what you'll be hearing over the next four months is uh, Robin will start uh, presenting <coughs> Chatham Elementary School and, and really what the, this, the rest of the, the superintendent's goals are this alignment of all of it, all of our professional development that we're doing and the data that we're sharing with each other and I think the best way to kind of help show and demonstrate that product is to have our principals kind of coming and doing the same presentation that they do with our group and uh, bringing that presentation here to you so uh, so uh, Robin will be uh, at the end of this month presenting to our team as part of our own little professional development, uh, the data from Chatham Elementary School to talk about what's working and, and, and really concretely where are we moving the ball forward in these strategic areas. Uh, and, uh, and she'll be, after presenting to us and us giving her feedback, will be coming and 
giving you that presentation. Uh, the following month, Sam will be uh, doing the presentation from Harwich Elementary School because we have a sort of scheduled to have this happen once a month and then the middle school and then the high school. And then as we head into our summer meetings, we'll actually get to talk about school this summer because we'll see that same sort of progression where the, uh, the admin team will come and talk about looking at uh, end of the year or sort of, you know, sort of middle of the year to the end of the year. Because remember, we, you know, we've been putting in place these map assessments. So we have, you know, we have sort of baseline at the beginning of the year. And uh, it, you know, so Robin will be running us through the growth that she's seeing happen. And you know, what initiatives that are they putting in place to help bolster that growth? And then we'll be looking from the middle of the year to the end of the year or, you know, or growth that's happening you know, over the entire year. So, you know, so you know, the, the goal is to, you know, to really come back and to present from a, you know, you know, from a building level, but to you know, collectively, after you hear each of those reports, get a feel for how we're moving forward on those initiatives, and I think that uh, that even when we were doing the budget presentation, just you know the 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 areas where we were growing less than the state average to trying to get the system so that we're consistently growing above that state average, I, I think that's that's part and parcel with what the focus is on, really uh, working collaboratively together to move the you know that you know that annual growth of our students so that we're. You know, we're significantly above the state average, and to get the you know to get those numbers uh, as high as we can. So that's that's where we're going. And um, as I said, knock on wood by our next school committee meeting, we'll have uh, one dissertation defense in the bag. And uh, uh, Dr. Millen will be here with uh, the first of a series of presentations uh, to the committee that are all tied in with strategic plan, going to school improvement <coughs> plans. Um, coming to you know coming down to individual growth any questions for mr. Carpenter this step um, since you brought up a tangent thing, um, my question is about the curriculum directive where are we on that well let's get that's to the superintendent's report, report. But, uh, okay <laughs> that's fine as long as it's happening tonight I can wait <laughs> any other questions for mr. Carpenter <coughs> thank you we will move on to an FY19 budget conversation. Um, we had our public hearing. We next meeting will have another discussion, and then we are looking to take our vote on the budget at our March 8th meeting. Um, so, look to have any conversation, any questions for anyone, or thoughts about where we are with our budget <coughs> before we move on to our last conversation about our budget before we vote on our budget. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Apparently we're just going to move on then. No? You know, if, you, if, if you want, I can um, just elaborate on, uh, on you know, just behind the scenes what's cha what changed between last time we presented and this time I had a, <coughs> had a we went to the Harwich selectmen's meeting you know there was a a, a clear request by four out of the five selectmen for us to sharpen our pencils and um, so uh, in conversations with the town manager uh, you know we talked about uh, trying to tighten you know see if we could tighten things and knowing that he was gonna have to tighten things on uh, on the town side so um, you know, the thing that's really important is that we preserve our programs, pr you know, preserve the services that we provide to families and still make sure that we move forward those strategic initiatives. And I'd really like to compliment Katie on, you know, going through the budget with a fine-tooth comb and, and trying to find ways to, you know, to kind of move a little further to, uh, you know, to support the uh, fiscal wherewithal of the town of Harwich. So we've provided numbers to Harwich so that they've got these numbers and at least from what I understand they'll be able to balance on their side uh, Katie and I have met with uh, the uh, Chatham town manager and finance director and believe that they can balance things on their side we'll hear it you know we'll hear uh, on uh, on Chatham's end on Monday night when we go present uh, present there but uh, but ideally if you know if all that 
goes through and uh, this gets presented at town meeting and passed, you know, it's, we're, in a, you know, we're in a good place to keep those programs going for our families. And, uh, and I think that's really important to have that sort of fiscal certainty so that our families can have some certainty about the quality of education that their kids are going to have. Thank you for the update. I, I think it's important to, to say that it's, you, it, you and Katie both were able to look at the budget and without automatically saying, well, the only way we're gonna be able to reduce anything is to cut teachers. And that's not the case at all. And so, you know, we are maintaining everything that we have and able to add a little bit more. So, you know, I, I'd say the, one of the bigger areas that we, in, you know, that we looking at trends happening this year is uh, you know just tying you know really good things that are happening in the school district and you know compliments to our facilities director you know we you know we have done things like in Harwich Elementary School you know with grant money replaced old lighting that you know was expensive to run with <coughs> LED lighting and when we looked at our utility bills and and the way they're tracking you know there was savings to be had you know so we were we were able to find ways, you know, things that we've been putting in place to be good environmental stewards, you know, have been able to pay off. Um, so, you know, so that's, you know, that's why you know, you know, we're, you know, we're able to kind of find some savings you know, looking back at the trends that, that we see coming in based on some, uh, you know, some good work that was done at, at Harwich Elementary School, saving a bunch of money on these new LED lights throughout the building. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion about the budget? And that is, we are going to the Chatham Board of Selectmen on Monday the 12th to present the budget to there. So if anybody would like to join the party. We'll also have a conversation about the regional agreement with the Chatham Selectmen on that night as well, like we did with Harwich. All right, so we will move on to a stabilization account. Ms. Isernio, are you jumping for that or no, you're not? <coughs> Are you I, looking like to grab you or something? Well, I think I, I, was gonna, I, I think we can just it's been part of the budget com, you know, conversation. So the you know what ideally we need to think about as a committee or you need to uh, discuss and potentially vote on is uh, we have now for over a year talked about forming a stabilization account. Uh, this the budget as presented has fifty thousand dollars that's earmarked to fund a stabilization account. Uh, in order for us to start the process, this committee needs to vote to establish a stabilization account. Then we need to get on both uh, select board agendas to request that they vote to allow the district to create a stabilization account. And then once, if all three of those votes happen or are passed, then this $50,000 that we have budgeted can, if the budget passes town meeting, you know, fund a stabilization count and get it started so that we have a reserve to go to should an item that we otherwise would borrow for, like a rooftop unit or, you know, one of the trucks that we might use to push snow or something were to die mid-year. One of the, you know, one of the refrigeration units in one of our, you know, one of our cafeterias. You know, yes, a expensive item to replace that, you know, you know when I talk about next year's budget is tight, you know, if a if one of our big refrigerators needed to get replaced mid-year, um, it's not in the budget, as Katie would point out. Yeah, you know, and and you know, this would allow us to have a reserve to go to for a capital need. Mr. Duvall, I move that we uh, vote to establish a stabilization account for the Montemoy Regional School District. I would second it. Look at all you jumping for a second. <laughs> So who actually seconded it? I got it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently Mr. Crafty had that one. Got it. All right, any <coughs> questions or discussion about that motion? It seems just Ms. Duck. completely responsible to do that and not responsible to admit that when we hear that these kind of things could happen. Great. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. And that ends our reports and discussions. We move into our subcommittee reports, of which there are none. 
which we move into Mr. Carpenter's superintendent's reports. Uh, this will be uh, short and brief, hopefully. I just want to remind the committee that tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., is the legislative breakfast at the Collaborative on Ventura Road, so uh, I'll be there. Apparently, while I've been sitting here, I've been texted that I'm supposed to go and come up with some sort of welcoming comment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so come join me for breakfast. Um, it'll be a hoot. Uh, and uh, I'll be the warm-up act for our legislators. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, to get to uh, Sharon's question about the uh, hiring uh, uh, for the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, we had uh, 22 applicants for the, uh, for the position. Uh, uh, a number of them very highly qualified. We uh, chose to interview six of them. Uh, we uh, 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 interviewed them for the uh, last two nights, uh, and I greatly appreciate the uh, the group that we had um, uh, on that uh, on that hiring committee. Uh, we have determined what finalists we would be moving forward. Uh, they are currently uh, having some time to talk with their. Uh, people and you know their uh, administrators and uh, faculty before we announce them it's a it's bad form for us to go and out them as our finalists uh, so uh, so they will be uh, having those conversations uh, uh, in the uh, upcoming day and on Monday we will formally announce uh, the finalists and uh, what we anticipate doing is uh, reference checks uh, we'll be visiting uh, and we will have them come here and invite you to uh, come and uh, meet the finalists and uh, we anticipate having an announcement of someone in place or at least you know, to hire effective July 1 uh, and uh, ideally have uh, him or her come to meet with the school committee at our next meeting which by the way is it going to be <coughs> Wednesday or Thursday well, it's been on the schedule for Wednesday. All right. Then I believe we'll <coughs> have, have them come join us on Wednesday, ideally, and uh, uh, say, a, say a few words. Look thoughtful. Question? No. Just up. Do we have a number of assembly or finalists here? I uh, cannot say at the moment. Okay. <laughs> You're trying to pull it all out, aren't you? Yeah, I want to know. Around <laughs> six. Yeah. Le six or less. Number less than six, six or, or less. less. Six or less. All right. That's pretty good. Is that to the end of your report? That would be it, unless right. you would like me to talk more. No, no, we're good. Well, you've heard enough of me tonight. You, you, you've done enough. <coughs> Thank you. All right, we move into our action items, of which we have two left. We have the, let somebody like to make a motion. Do you have to come talk about this one, too? No. To approve the network and wireless contract for the elementary schools that we discussed at our last meeting. Um, Ms. Isernio presented that she went out to bid and in your packet is the recommendation of who we would award that bid to. Would anybody care to make said motion? Don't all jump up at once. We don't get to go home until they're done. Mr. Duvall. Oh. Wait, wait, I think, I think Ms. Long actually would like to. No, yeah. Ms. Long, please. Ms. Long. Um, I move please. to approve the network and wireless contract for the elementary schools as proposed on January 28th, Fifth. excuse me, 25th, 2018. Two. The Opera's company. Oh, excuse me. Is it in front of me? Yes. Bottom. Bottom four. Bottom. To the Auker's company, do, do I need to list the pricing as follows? Yes. The pricing is as follows: Chatham Elementary School thirty-five thousand one hundred and fifty-nine, and Harwich Elementary School one hundred nineteen thousand seven hundred and eighty-four, for a total award of one hundred and fifty-four thousand nine hundred and forty-three dollars. This is an e rate. No, that's, that's good. You're great. Anybody care to second? Second. Well done, Mr. Wall. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Long. 
And the next is a payment of a prior invoice, which is also in our packet. Looks like we have an invoice from Bryden and Sullivan Insurance Agency. Mr. Duvall. I move that we approve the payment of the uh, invoice from Bryden and Sullivan Insurance Agency for um, an add-on of a 2016 Ford truck in the amount of $452. Second. Thank you. Any discussion and questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And that is unanimous as well, which brings us to the end of our agenda in which somebody cared to make a motion to adjourn into executive session pursuant to Master of the Law 38, Section 21, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining units and to discuss a Unit A MREA Level 3 grievance coming out for adjournment only. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. And roll call vote, Ms. Richardson. Aye. Mr. Crappy. Aye. Ms. Sheehan. Aye. Ms. Russell. Aye. Ms. Long. Aye. Ms. Stout. Aye. Mr. Duvall. Aye. Chair says aye. It is unanimous. And we are adjourning into that at 810. Thank you very much. That wasn't me. Wow, I really it's mocked right. that. Just don't try. But you're trying. You're trying. Yeah. You know? I, do trying much better. Better. I do much better at the oh, other. What's what? The surplus? The excess and surplus? I, I got those. Yeah. 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 Yeah.